ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد ان شاء الله we're going to begin uh, where we left off with the lessons on aqidah before ramadan uh, but inshallah we're going to start a new text um, originally we began with a small text called Asl Deen Al-Islam Wa Qa'idatuhu or the basis or the, the fundamental roots of Islam and its basis um, and then we moved on from there to a book called um, Al-Usul Al-Thalatha both by um, Imam Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahab and inshallah we're going to move on um, starting tonight to a book called Kashf Al-Shubahati Fi Al-Tawheed or the clarification of the doubts or the misconceptions regarding Tawheed. Um, so this is the book that we're going to um, begin with today. Uh, it's about, in Arabic, it's about 30 pages or 25 pages depending on the um, version that you get. And translated into English, I think it's about, I don't know, 60 pages or 65 pages. Um, it's available in English and Arabic on the internet. So if anyone wants to print off a copy um, or order a copy to follow along, that's um, you know perfectly fine, that's a good idea if you want to take notes, inshallah. <coughs> so just um, a bit to start about uh, talking about this book. Um, it was written also by Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, um, and it was written, um, well just I guess a bit of a background on who this person was and why there's so much written by him on the issues of Tawheed and Shirk. Um, he lived in a place called Najd, which is currently, um, it, or it's in the Arabian Peninsula, um, and it's the area in Saudi Arabia which is, um, you know, about in the middle of the peninsula. So to the west of it is Hijaz, which contains Mecca and Medina, and beneath it to the south, um, there's Yemen um, and uh, Oman, and then um, to the east, there is uh, Bahrain and Qatar and those areas, and then to the north there's Syria, um, and Iraq and elsewhere. So it's the area in the middle of the Arabian Peninsula. Um, this da'wah or the da'wah of, of, uh, of these Imams began in Najd. It began in a place called Huraymara, which is beside Al Riyadh currently. Um, and the Shaykh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, his father was a Qadi or a Muslim or Islamic judge in that area. And the reason why this da'wah began was because in that time Shirk became quite widespread, people would go to graves and make dua to the people in the graves and they would make dhabah or slaughter or sacrifice animals for the people in the graves there um, and they would make uh, oaths to those people in the graves and they would seek barakah or blessings from trees and stones and essentially reverted back to what um, the, uh, the the religion in the Arabian Peninsula was before the, the sending of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam except that they were, they were doing the same things saying the same things, believing the same things except that they claimed to be Muslim so that was the only difference um, but all the actions were essentially the same so a book was written called Kitab al-Tawheed um, in which um, the Shaykh put together a number of chapters discussing uh, many issues on Tawheed so showing the obligation of Tawheed um, and what Tawheed is and what Shirk is and what actions are only deserving by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so on and so on from the book or clarifying this from the Quran and the Sunnah and the understanding of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum trying to call people back to the correct religion um, and to teach them that which the Prophet sallallahu was sent with at that point there began, there began a backlash against this da'wah so this calling back to the pure Islam, there was a, a backlash. People didn't like the idea of being told, you know what, you can't bury people in the masajid, you can't build masajid around graves, you can't light up uh, you know, uh, lamps at your graves and seeking barakah, and you can't slaughter for other than Allah. People didn't, they became so used to this issue that there became a backlash to this. And some people actually began to understand this to be the correct meaning of Islam. So obviously they, they fought back or they, you know, so they would begin to send out um, letters warning against this da'wah and trying to bring evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah uh, to prove 
their, that their actions were correct. And to prove that this da'wah to Tawheed is actually incorrect and that it's actually not supported by the Qur'an and the Sunnah and so on and so on. Um, so this book, Kashf al-Shubahat, was written in response to some of these uh, shubuhat or some of these misconceptions that were being spread. Um, particularly, as the Shaykh mentions in this um, book, that one of the scholars in the area of Al-Ahsa, which is an area in the Arabian Peninsula, um, he wrote a letter with a number of supposed evidences trying to prove that these actions of shirk were actually Islamic and they didn't contradict Islam and so on and so on. So the Shaykh wrote this book um, in response um, to this. And after him, this da'wah continued from his sons, um, Al-Hasan um, ibn Muhammad and, and uh, uh, Suleiman, um, or Abdullah ibn Muhammad, sorry, and then his grandsons, Abdurrahman ibn Hassan ibn Muhammad and Suleiman ibn Abdullah ibn Muhammad, as well as other ulama from that area, such as the Shaykh uh, Abdullah ibn Abdurrahman, Abu Butain, and Suleiman ibn Sahman, and Hamid ibn Atiq al Najdi, and so on and so on. So this da'wah continued and it became stronger, alhamdulillah, that it began to spread and people began throughout, uh, you know, a matter of years and years and decades even that alhamdulillah um, a lot of the shirk was erased um, so the reason why we be, be, I'm beginning with this is because uh, this book has a number of sections to it so one of the sections is just clarifying what is exactly tawheed what is shirk um, what was the beliefs of the kuffar at the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam um, why they weren't actually considered Muslim despite, as we'll see, the kuffar at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu believed in Allah. They believed that he, was, he existed, they believed that he was the creator and the one that sustained everything and so on. But well, why weren't these people Muslim? And he clarifies this. Then he goes on into another section and begins to discuss some of the, uh, the evidences that are supposedly used or used by the people who um, try to perf or to say that these actions are allowed, as well as just some of the arguments that they make, and then he has a, a conclusion in which he discusses the importance of um, acting upon tawheed and that and to show how just having this belief in your heart isn't sufficient, and it's you have to act upon tawheed, you have to um, uh, have these statements as well as have these beliefs in your heart. So how all of these things are important. Um, in order for the person to be Muslim, and he has a section on this as well. So this was um, the, uh, you know, how, how this book is divided up. Um, and in explaining this, there's a number of books uh, that were written by his sons and his grandsons and the scholars after him as an explanation or commentary on this book. Some of, one of them was uh, Mufid al-Mustafid, which was by Ibn Abdul Wahab himself. Um, so some of this explanation will be taken from this, as well as the book um, Taysir al-Aziz al-Hamid, which is an explanation of the book Kitab al-Tawheed by Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, and the explanation was written by his grandson Suleiman ibn Abdullah, who uh, didn't actually finish this book because he was killed by um, the Turkish, I guess they call it at the time, the Viceroy from England, who at the time gave a command that this person should be killed due to the resistance that this da'wah was being put up to the, to the um, colonialization of that area at the time um, and he was ordered to be executed and was killed um, by their... So this book actually remained unfinished. Also the book uh, uh, Al-Intisar by Abdullah Abu Butain, who was from the scholars as well, um, and a book by Abdul Latif ibn Abdul Rahman um, called Minhaj uh, al-Tasis and lastly a book by Abdurrahman al-Dawsari um, May Allah SWT have mercy on all of them in which they clarify these issues and they add commentary because very often you'll find that some shirk will disappear and people will come up with some sort of new shirk so clarifying tawheed is easy because it's very simple and it remains constant all the time but shirk may change people will come up with new types of shirk depending on the time and the area so often that needs extra commentary and explanation is needed for that. So um, that's why you'll see that uh, you know throughout history, since this book was written, different commentaries were um, put uh, put towards this book. Um, yeah. So this is the just kind of an introduction as to the reason why the book was written. 
um, and some of the issues about the book. Um, and then if uh, we can read just the beginning part of it. Just the first page? Just up to uh, where he mentions about the people of Nuh. Masr, I think, is the last. Uh, yes. uh, in the name of Allah, the most merciful, ever, ever merciful to his believing servants. No, may Allah have mercy upon you that Tawheed monotheism is to single out Allah. Free is he from all imperfections with all forms of worship, ibadah, and this is the religion of the messengers sent by Allah to his servants. The messengers and their peoples, the first of them was Nuh alayhi salam. Allah sent him to his people when they exaggerated the status of the righteous people, such as Wa'ad, Suwa, Yaqub, Yaqub, and Nasr. So here the, the author begins with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and we've talked about this before in, uh, when we talked about the Rasul al-Thalatha. So the, the Bismillah was um, used by the Prophet ﷺ when he would um, write his letters, particularly the most famous one is the one that he wrote to kiss to uh, um, Hiraqal, that's narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari, in which um, Heraclius received a letter from the Prophet ﷺ and it said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, min Muhammad ibn Abdullah ila Hiraqla azim al-Rum, or from Muhammad, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, from the Muhammad ibn Abdullah to Heraclius, the leader of Rome, or the leader of the Romans. So the scholars have taken from this that it's sunnah to begin uh, any sort of interaction with the Basmala or the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, the only difference of opinion is with regards to um, what is best to begin with, because we have Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim uh, is what the Prophet ﷺ would begin his letters with. Also, we know in, in the Quran when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned about um, Suleiman alayhi salatu wasalam when he sent the letter to the queen of <coughs> the queen of Saba, that it began with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began the Quran with the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And we know that every surah begins with this as well, except for Surah Bara'a. So obviously beginning with the Basmala is something that's virtuous. Um, some you'll find they begin their speeches with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim um, or they'll begin their uh, letters or their books with Alhamdulillah or Inna Alhamdulillah and so on. There's a dispute amongst the scholars as to what is best because if we look to the letters of the Prophet wasallam, they so anything written from him always began with the basmala and whenever he spoke there's nothing specifically narrated from the prophet ﷺ that when he spoke he began with the basmala what we have is the hadith of abdullah bin mas'ud in khutbat al-haja um, when he would begin with in alhamdulillah nahmadu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruhu to the uh, to the end of the hadith um, and we also have a hadith of jabir radiyallahu anhu in which a people came to the prophet ﷺ and he began it with some ayat from the quran um, so this is the dispute. So if we look at all of these evidences, we can say that the sunnah is to begin speeches with Alhamdulillah or ayat from the Quran, particularly Ya uh, Nas, Ittaqu Rabbakum, and anything with these types of uh, these types of verses. And when you're writing something, you begin it with the basmala. So if you're writing a book or a letter or a letter to somebody else and so on. This would begin with the basmala, as this is the most precise um, of what the Prophet ﷺ did. So, if you were to do this, you're following you're following these ahadith where they apply, and you're following these ahadith um, where they apply. So, this is the strongest um, way of going about things. Allahu um, alam. So, this is the first uh, issue that in that the, the author mentioned um, the basmala. After mentioning um, the basmala. Uh, he went on and he said, "I'lam um, rahimakallah," or "No, may Allah have mercy upon you." So here he, you'll often find throughout his letters and um, some of the other scholars, they'll they'll continuously say, "No, may Allah have mercy on you." No, may Allah forgive you. The, when you when they're saying this, when they say no, obviously they're telling you, you have knowledge about this issue. So they're calling your attention to what's about to be said. 
because it's something of importance and they want your attention to be 100% to this or they want you to focus on this. So they're telling us to have knowledge. So meaning don't be ignorant of this issue that I'm about to speak about. So if we understand well, what is knowledge? Knowledge in reality is knowing something in the way that it actually is. So if someone says this thing right here is black, then obviously it is black. If they know that it's black, then it's knowledge because the reality of this thing is that it's black. Knowing that it's black, that's knowledge. If someone came and said, what is this color? And you said, I don't know. Obviously that's not knowledge. It's considered ignorance. Uh, the scholars divide ignorance into two types. One is called al-jahl uh, al-basit or uh, simple ignorance. And the second is al-jahl al-murakkab or compound ignorance. So what is the difference between the, the two? If I say, well, what's, what, what color is this? And you say, I don't know. You don't know it, That's you're, you're ignorant of that color. If I come and say, well, what color is this? And you say it's blue. You don't know the color and you think it's something else too. So you're ignorant of the color and you're ignorant of your ignorance. So it's compound now. So this is the danger of things. If someone is just ignorant of an issue, you can tell them, oh, you know what? That's actually, it's actually black. And they go, okay, well, thank you. And then now they know. If you tell, if they say, no, this is blue, and then you want to argue with them, well, they already have in their mind that I know the answer to this issue. Now you have an argument on your hand. And that's why um, ignorance in and of itself is dangerous, but compound ignorance is even worse because they don't know and they don't know that they don't know. So this is why speaking without knowledge is such a dangerous, dangerous issue because if you're not correct, then not only are you not giving the right answer, you're giving a wrong answer. So you're spreading something that now, well now two things need to be done to get through to this person. First, you have to show that to them uh, that they actually don't know what they're talking about. And secondly, you have to teach them the right answer. So this is when it comes to uh, knowledge and uh, ignorance. So this is just kind of more of a, an issue related to usul al-fiqh, which um, you'll be getting into inshallah next week with Sheikh Harith. Um, but just to kind of comment on what the author said about this issue. Uh, next, um, the author says, uh, Rahimakallah. So here he's. This shows that there's some sincerity in what the author is saying. So he's telling you that you should know this. May Allah have mercy on you. So it's not that um, it's something that this person just wants to tell you what they think, and there's no point behind it. The point of it is that may you ha may you know this issue so that you'll, Allah will have mercy upon you. So there's a, a goal behind it. It's 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 a sincerity from a Muslim to another or from a Muslim to a non-Muslim wanting to bring them um, to the correct um, beliefs. And then he says, اعلم رحمك الله أن التوحيد or that the tawheed. So here when he talks about tawheed, he's talking about a specific type of tawheed. So as many of you may know, um, tawheed is divided into a number of categories. So there's tawheed al rububiyyah or the tawheed of uh, lordship or dominion. So this is the belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything. He has power to manipulate anything that, that's within his will or to change anything in his will, to provide sustenance to everything or anything that he wants. Everything is under his control. So this is tawheed al rububiyyah There's tawheed al uluhiyyah and this is the tawheed as we'll come to see that the messengers were sent with. So this is the tawheed which is belief that Allah is the only one who deserves to be worshipped. So not only do we believe in His existence and His power and His might and His wisdom and His knowledge, we believe that He's the only one who has the right to be worshipped. And we only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any aspect that's an act of worship. So anything that is a right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, then we only do it for Him and we don't do it for anyone else or anything else. So this is Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah and sometimes it's referred to as Tawheed al-Ilahiyyah and lastly um, Tawheed al-Asma wa sifat or the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and his attributes as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, mentioned that he has names and he mentioned about himself specific attributes and the Sahaba affirmed these attributes from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or from that for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so these are the three types of Tawheed um, Sometimes you'll see them referred to as Tawheed al-Qasd wal-Talab wal-Irada which is the Tawheed of intention and, see and uh, seeking and um, so, that, uh, so this is referring to what the slave does for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
and also Tawheed al-Ma'rifah with ithbat with the Tawheed of knowledge and affirmation. So these are, in the end, whether you take this division or this division, the point is that anything that belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we affirm it. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned something about him, we affirm it. If he negated something off of himself, if he said he doesn't have a son, he doesn't have a wife, he doesn't sleep, he doesn't uh, become drowsy, so on and so on, anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negated off of himself, we negate off of him. Anything that he deserves, we give him. Anything that he doesn't, that only he deserves, we don't give to anyone else, and so on and so on. So this is um, just a general explanation of all these types of tawheed. Specifically here, the author is talking about the second, which is tawheed al-ilahiyah, which is what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserve? And what is from the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we can't give to anyone else? So these, this is where the dispute came between the messengers who were sent, alayhim salatu salam, and the people who they were sent to. Because as we will see in the Quran, there is, uh, no one is, no group is, is mentioned as completely disbelieving in the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we know that the prophets weren't sent to te tell people that Allah exists because everyone in the Quran is, that's mentioned knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. So that's, they weren't, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send someone to people to teach them something that they've already accepted? This wouldn't um, be within his wisdom uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as we'll see, the tawheed that is being discussed here is uh, the tawheed of um, Godship or the tawheed of ilahiyah. Then he went on to say that and it is, so meaning Tawheed, is the deen or the religion of all of um, the messengers. So he, the next thing is to discuss, well, if he's saying it's the religion or the deen of all the messengers, what does the word deen actually mean? So we can see that the word deen has a number of meanings that are mentioned in the Quran. Um, the first is the mulk or the sultan, which is the control or the authority. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referred um, to the story of Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam when he said, مَا كَانَ لِيَأْخُذَ أَخَاهُ فِي دِينِ الْمَلِكِ Or that he wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been able, he wouldn't have been able to take back his brother within the authority or the, uh, the rule of the king. So we know that according to the rule of the king, what Yusuf did as a means to get his brother back to him, he wouldn't have been able to do um, if, he if he had followed the law or the authority of the king at that point. So here we know that the, the word religion or the word deen in this sense refers to authority um, and uh, control. Also, it can be the path or the tariqah when Allah Taala said, قُلْ يَا أَيْهُ الْكَافِرُونَ till the end of the surah when he said, لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَ دِينُ Or you have your way and I have my way. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referred to the Muslimin as having one way and the Kuffar having another way and he used the word deen for that. Also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or another meaning of deen is the law or the uh, power of or what laws are implemented. <clears throat> as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَيَكُونَ الدِّينُ كُلُّهُ لِلَّهِ Or that and fight them until the religion or the deen is all or until there's no more fitna and the deen is all for Allah. So here what is meant is the rule or the actual governing um, in the land. So here this is referring to, this is what the deen is meant, what is meant by deen in this verse because we know that the Prophet ﷺ um, commanded his armies to, when fighting the kuffar, to first call them to Islam. If they accepted Islam, then everything was done. If they didn't accept Islam, then the next choice that they had was to submit to the law of Islam and pay the jizya. And if they didn't, then, you know, then they were to, um, then the Muslim would fight them. So here we see that when people, or Allah SWT ordered the Muslim to fight the kuffar until there's no more fitna and the religion is all for Allah. But at the same time, we know that there's a certain point in which the Muslim by the command of the Prophet ﷺ, wouldn't fight the people anymore, even though they hadn't become Muslim. So we obviously know from this verse that what is meant is the actual rule in the land. So this is what is meant by <coughs> by the deen um, in this verse. Also, another meaning of uh, deen is actions, or the way a person acts. 
this is based upon <clears throat> the saying in, in Arabi that you say Kama tudinu tudan or as you act towards people they will act towards you so the word deen here just refers to the way a person acts towards another um, and also the last meaning that a deen has is, is the actual legislation um, or the law that is followed not necessarily as a in the land but can even be in more in the sense of a religious law as Allah SWT said till the end of the verse or that Allah SWT said about himself and he legislated for you in the religion or in the deen that which he advised with or gave to Nuh and then he mentioned other prophets after that um, so these are the meanings of the word deen um, and also there's other meanings as well um, such as the jaza or the recompense when Allah SWT said Maliki uh, Yawmuddin or the uh, the controller of the day of the deen which is the recompense so the point here is that when we, and when we say deen in this sense what we're meaning is it was the law which all of the prophets came with alayhi salatu as salam as we'll see that every prophet was sent with teaching the people tawheed and warning them from shirk and calling them to give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his rights and to not give these things to um, anyone else. Then he said, فَأَوَّلُهُمْ Nuh عَلَيْهِ salam." So here he's saying that the first prophet was Nuh um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail because we discussed this before when we in the, the lessons on al-usul al-thalatha but there's a difference of opinion on um, the messengers. Who was the first messenger? So the majority hold the opinion that Nuh alayhi salatu salam was the first messenger and the evidence that they use for this is the hadith um, in which the Prophet ﷺ mentioned what will take place on the day of judgment and when the people will want the judgment to begin due to the harshness and the severity of that day that they will go to Adam first and ask him can you make intercession or shafa'ah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to begin this this judgment so that we can, you know, be, be done with it. So he will say, اِذْهَبُوا um, إِلَى نُوحِ فَإِنَّهُ أَوَّلَ رَسُولٍ أُرْسِيلَ إِلَى النَّاسِ Or the meaning of the hadith, that go to Nuh because he's the first messenger that was sent to the people or to the people of the earth. So this is the evidence that's used by the majority. Um, some of the uh, scholars such as Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani and Hafid al-Hakami and others say that the first messenger was actually Adam alayhi salatu salam and the evidence that they use for this um, is uh, the verse when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Allah istafa Adam wa Nuhan wa ala Ibrahim wa ala Imran ala al-alameen so they say that Nuh and Adam what they were chosen with or the, 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 this choice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave or picked them with was that they were given the risala and that they were messengers um, but Allahu Alam, it's quite clear in the hadith of the Shafa'ah that the first messenger that was sent to the people of the earth was Nuh alayhi salatu salam and Adam and any prophets that were before him were prophets and not messengers. So the issue then is, well, what's the difference between them? And again, I'm not going to go too, into too much detail on this because we've discussed it before, but there's a number of differences of opinion as to what is the difference between uh, a prophet and a messenger. Some say there's no difference. Some say there is a difference, and the difference is a prophet or a messenger, sorry, br brings a new sharia, and a prophet merely uh, abrogates certain parts in that general sharia. So, for example, they'll say that um, uh, Musa alayhi salatu salam was a messenger and that he came with the Torah and the law that was in the Torah, and the prophets after him would either rule with that, um, uh, with that. Um, Sharia, and they wouldn't bring a new Sharia. And they'll use, for example, the verse when Allah SWT mentioned about, about the Torah, يَحْكُمُ بِهَا النَّبِيُّونَ or that the prophets would judge with it. So they'll say that this was actually what the prophets were, they would judge with it. Um, and others say that if they came with a book, then they were a, prophet, a messenger. If they came without a book, they weren't a, a messenger. Some will say if Allah SWT spoke to them directly, uh, then they were a messenger and if he spoke to them through Jibreel um, then he, they would be a prophet and so on and so on um, and Allahu Alam there's nothing clear on what, what the difference is between a prophet and a messenger 
all we know that is for sure that there is a difference between them because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned them together obviously for, for a reason that they were that they were different um, he mentioned that the, that there were prophets and messengers so we know that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wouldn't mention two groups of people in the same verse if they were the same people because there would be no point um, in doing so um, so this is uh, you know just a, a little bit of a discussion the only thing to make a note on here is that there's a widespread opinion that prophets are those who receive wahi or a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but aren't told to go to amongst the people and um, convey it while messengers receive wahi and they have to convey it but if we look at the Quran and the Sunnah that this is a very like it's a false opinion or it's an incorrect opinion because there's a number of evidences um, in the Quran and the Sunnah that indicate that um, the uh, that the messengers are actually or the prophets are actually sent and they're ordered to convey so first of all from an aql or from an intellect point of view Allah SWT gives wahi and revelation to people for a reason he doesn't do it for no reason so why would he give revelation to a people or to a person and then they don't actually have to convey it what would be the point in this and what would be the benefit to humankind um, of, for them to receive this wahi and then not have to tell anybody about it but obviously we go to the Quran and the Sunnah first so from the um, the uh, Quran I'm sorry from the Sunnah the clearest hadith is the hadith um, of the um, when, Allah, when the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that he was given five things أُعْتِيتُ خَمْسًا لَمْ يُعْطِهَا أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ قَبْلِي and then so or I was given five things that none of the prophets before me were given so he mentioned that the ghanima was made for, permissible for him so the spoils of war were permissible for the Prophet ﷺ <coughs> and he mentioned that he was given Jawami al kalim or the all-encompassing short words. So meaning he would say a very small amount, a number of words, and it would contain a lot of meaning and benefit. Um, and that the third was that the Prophet sallallahu um, is the last of the prophets, and and obviously every other prophet before him wasn't the last. And the fourth is that the all of the earth was made as a masjid and a means of, of purification for. The Muslimin. So we know that anywhere in the earth that we are, we can pray, and anywhere in the earth we can use the land for our tahara if we have no water. And this was something that wasn't present in the uh, um, uh, the nations before us. And the issue for this hadith or for this topic is when the Prophet ﷺ said, "Wa kan nabiyyu yubath ila qawmihi khassa wa buathu ila nasi amma," or that and the Prophet used to be sent specifically to his people, and I was sent to all of the people. So we see here that he mentioned that the prophets before were sent only to their people uh, and I was sent to all the people. So obviously we know that this misconception that people have that prophets were those who received revelation but weren't commanded to, to be to or weren't sent out amongst the people is false because the Prophet ﷺ said and the prophets used to be sent specifically to their people and I was sent to all the people. So. The, the, the point to take away from this is that this is a misconception and we know that the prophets, whether they're a messenger or just the prophet, they're all, they're all commanded to convey what they received um, from Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and inshallah, I guess we'll stop there. I don't want to go too long. Um, so next week, this Aqidah lesson will be on Thursdays from, from here on in. And Wednesdays will be the lesson on Usul al-Fiqh or the fundamental rules of fiqh with um, Sheikh Harith and that'll, they'll, these will all be after Maghrib so if you're wanting to continue with this lesson it'll be moved to Thursday and likewise I encourage everyone to um, attend the Wednesday one because it's something that ha hasn't been done before in this or he's the only one who's done these lessons in the city before um, particularly if you're attending the Tuesday fiqh lessons it's very beneficial to attend the Wednesday Usul al-Fiqh lessons because there's some issues that I would have talked about um, in those lessons, but he's going to go into them with a lot more detail. Um, so, you know, if you're able to attend those, I think it'd be a great benefit. Um, inshallah, we'll stop there and have time for questions. Wallahu